everyone. We've got uh, welcome. We are uh, live, and my name is James Wilson from the uh, Research on Research Institute uh, in the UK, uh, and it's my pleasure to be um, moderating this uh, session, which is billed as a debate. I think it's probably going to be a, a, a set of slightly contrasting perspectives rather than a full-on formal debate, but uh, uh, I think it'll be illuminating nonetheless. And we've got a great panel to. Uh, uh, take us through some different um, uh, insights and, and angles on uh, one of the biggest meta science questions, uh, uh, the, the state and fate of peer review, which has, of course, been even more uh, uh, visible and prominent on everyone's agendas over the course of the pandemic, when particularly the use of preprints has been, of course, uh, one of the big uh, science culture stories of the past uh, 18, 20 months. Um, peer review, of course, uh, is a, a critical underpinning of the science system um, and, and a mechanism through which we at least strive if we don't always meet uh, some of the goals of uh, uh, rigour and, and objectivity in science. Um, but we also, of course, all know, particularly those of us who are academics and, and live and die by peer review, that it is a system with, with, with flaws as well as strengths. Um, and it's also a system that's under pressure from various directions. Uh, 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 the demands on the peer review system uh, in line with growth in the overall science system have swelled uh, in recent years and in, and in many parts of that system are uh, creaking, uh, if not uh, you know, breaking altogether. So there's lots uh, to discuss here. What we want to focus on uh, in the next hour is this specific question of when in the cycle should peer review take place? Um, are we doing peer review? Uh, at the wrong point in the process, should we do it uh, uh, differently? Uh, and as I say, we're not going to have um, uh, a sort of formal debate with two people on each side. It's going to be more of a, a spectrum of views. And we hope, of course, to be bringing in as many of your uh, comments and questions as well as we go along. So do make uh, liberal use of both the Q&A function in Zoom and also uh, the chat function. Um, as I say, we've got a great panel to join us and, and, and guide us through these issues. I'll introduce them all. Uh, now and then more briefly one by one as they speak. We're going to hear first from uh, Emily Senna, who is a senior lecturer at the Centre for Clinical Brain Sciences at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, welcome, Emily. Um, Emily will be followed by Liam Kofi Bright, who's assistant professor in the Department of Philosophy, Logic and Scientific Method at the LSE, the London School of Economics. Uh, thank you, Liam. Uh, and then we're moving uh, right over the other side of the world to uh, Remco uh, Heeson, who is uh, a philosopher of science at the University of Western Australia, and it's uh, uh, Remco just told me it's 10 p.m. there at the moment, so he's doing uh, he's doing very well to look uh, bright and bushy-tailed. We'll try and keep him that way for the next hour. Uh, last but by no means least, we're going to hear from Daniela uh, Sideri, who is the co-founder and director of Pre-Review, uh, which is a, a project set up to bring more equity and transparency uh, to the evaluation, evaluation of research, research content. content. Uh, so thank you all very much for taking the time. Um, I think uh, some, but not all of you have slides, but we'll keep uh, um, hopefully the formal bits uh, to good time. So we have plenty of time for discussion. Uh, I'm going to go first to Emily and ask you to, to kick us off. Over to you, Emily. Oh, then I'll start in the middle there. <laughs> um, I can't see you all, so I'm hoping that you can hear me and see my slides. All good. Um, so thank you very much for, for having me. I am um, going to kick things off. So the debate, set, you know, the question is, should peer review occur before or after publication? I don't think I've actually necessarily answered this question um, in this introduction set of slides, but more, I guess, try to highlight some of the issues that we have um, in the process at the moment. Um, sorry, I'm having, there we go. So I will start with disclosures. And I think for this talk, um, these are particularly pertinent. Um, I am editor in chief of BMJ Open Science, um, where we, we do peer review, I think in the kind of more traditional sense. Um, and also I'm a co-founder and on the managing board for PCI, Peer Community in Registered Reports, which um, is a platform for reviewing preprints. 
So just a bit about my perspective, um, so you understand where I'm coming from. I am a neuroscientist, but I'm generally interested in the modeling of human diseases in animals in the laboratory but I take a meta-research um, approach to the work I do, so lots of systematic reviews, trying to understand um, what makes experimental models valid and useful to translate to the clinic. So if we think about um, journals and why journals are considered important, well, research is, is incremental and journals serve as the permanent record of science. They, research articles should, uh, I should underline the word, should contain sufficient information to allow others to both replicate research, but also evaluate what's been done. Um, and articles also help us learn. And I guess the peer review process attempts to validate the methods that are used in, in studies and also the scientific processes, and they're seen as a marker of credibility. You know, it's the question that's often asked, was that studied peer reviewed? And if, you know, if it's a yes, then I think people interpret that as, as then a credible um, piece of research. But articles are also the mode with which, um, peer reviewed articles are the mode with which we evaluate our scientific output as academics and journals and I guess, you know, the editors and, and publishers are to some extent the gatekeepers of this process. And this is uh, maybe a slightly naive um, view, but I think the peer review process and just the, you know, the process of how we disseminate our research, I imagine it worked quite well for the 19th century scientists where um, the incentive structure was really around, and this, this quote here, you know, I must find the explanation for, the pheno for this phenomenon to truly understand nature. Whereas now it's, I must get my results to fit the narrative so I can get my paper into nature. And I think these, this incentive structure, structure has a huge influence on how, um, how we present the research that we do. So just to give you, I said I'm a, um, interested in the modeling of human diseases. And this is an example of how sometimes our research in the past hasn't maybe had as much impact as it could have done. This was a study published by colleagues actually based uh, in Australia. Um, and they did a large systematic review looking at all interventions tested in models of stroke. And they identified over a thousand different interventions. 600 of these interventions were tested in uh, animal models of stroke. 374 were shown to be effective in these animal models. Just under 100 were taken forward to be tested in clinical trials. And only one intervention, clot busting um, treatment with thrombolysis, was shown to be effective in trials. So we've got this huge um, attrition. There are some additional interventions that don't have the supporting animal data. And to be honest, presenting the data like this is slightly disingenuous because it's not that you know, the animal studies showed this, there, was an, there was an effect of this intervention and it was taken forward to clinical trial. But actually a lot of the animal studies were conducted after um, the trial was completed for, for thrombolysis. Um, so a lot of my research has been trying to understand what are the different sources of bias that happen in, in um, preclinical research. And like I said, we do lots of systematic reviews. And we're essentially assessing peer, the peer reviewed literature, trying to look at how things were reported um, and um, identifying the impact of potential sources of bias. And now there's lots of different um, reasons why effects might be seen in an animal, you know, in an animal study and not translate to a clinical setting. And I'm just focusing for the purpose of this talk, at, you know, looking at one. Um, threat to the validity of research, internal validity. So this is the strength of the cause-effect relationship in the study. Are we seeing the effect of an intervention because of um, the drug itself or the intervention itself, or is it because of other unknown um, sources of bias? Emily, I'm and very sorry to inter at the reporting of measures to reduce risk of bias in the preclinical literature, not just in stroke, but across lots of different disease areas. Um, this example, I'm showing you um, the reporting of randomization and blinded assessment of outcome, very 
key methodological um, factors to ensure um, robustness in the study across stroke, motor neuron disease, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, EAE, which is a model of um, MS and glioma. We see very few studies report. Um, Emily, I'm very sorry to interrupt you. There's a, group, there's a black bar at the top of your screen. Blinding the assessment of outcome. And it's not just that these biases are prevalent, but it appears that they're also important um, in meta-analyses. We have stratified data looking at studies that do do and don't report measures to reduce risks of bias. And we see in this data set, this is an example taken from a stroke review that we did, the studies that don't report um, randomization are associated, associated with much larger estimates of effect than studies that do take um, this measure to reduce risks of bias. Emily, sorry to interrupt and, you. Um, Can you hear me, Emily? Often said, well, you know, you're looking at reasons for translational failure, um, you know, and maybe it's, you know, some of this research isn't published in good quality journals, you know, peer review is, should pick up things, you know, when people aren't randomizing or blinding their studies. And in our um, data set, we've looked at the prevalence of reporting measures to reduce the risks of bias um, across a sample of papers um, and looked at look at the papers, uh, the journals, sorry, by decil of impact factor. So these are the high impact factor journals, you know, the single name journals. Um, and these are the, the lower impact factor journals. And essentially we don't see a relationship between journal impact factor and the prevalence of reporting randomization, blinded assessment of outcome, or um, an a priori sample size calculation. We do, however, see that, you know, the large, the high impact factor journals are associated with reporting conflicts of interest statements. And there are a number of improvement strategies um, that are in place to try and facilitate improved reporting um, that journals have also tried to use to support the peer review process. So the Equator Network um, has lots of resources um, to ensure that we enhance the transparency of the quality of our reporting in health research. Um, specifically for clinical trials, we've got the consort guidelines for animal studies, we've got the ARRIVE guidelines. You know, these, these are just two examples, there's lots of different resources out there and generally they're endorsed by the journals, by, you know, funders, universities, learning societies, saying we ask our authors and our peer reviewers to ensure that the manuscripts have been um, reported in line um, with these guidelines. Um, but it appears that endorsing um, guidelines doesn't necessarily translate to improved quality of reporting. In our research group, we've conducted two different studies, um, an observational study and a randomized controlled trial um, with different publishers looking at um, checklists, reporting checklist implementation. So with Nature, um, I think it was an observational study, so it was a before and after study um, before they implemented their reporting checklist um, to see whether or not the implementation of their checklist then led after the implementation led to improved reporting of these four key measures to reduce risk of bias. Um, and none reported all four before the checklist. There was a slight improvement um, after. And a randomized controlled trial with PLOS, um, we randomized authors to being requested to submit a checklist um, and success was reporting all of the arrive items and in neither the control of the intervention group did we see um, any manuscript um, meet all these items. Um, so what we know is that journals simply requesting authors to complete an arrive checklist doesn't lead to improved reporting. The introduction of a checklist, um, at least at the Nature Publishing Group, was associated with improved reporting that you know, we didn't see in other journals, though the conditions obviously are different. Um, improvement strategies, I think, which focus on priority aspects of reporting might have greater success, but I think this is an empirical question. Um, and as it stands, I believe that peer review is probably not fit for purpose. There's very limited guidance or framework around what to assess. Um, there's issues around credit for um, researchers in terms of doing peer reviews. And there's obviously very limited training, although that 
it does exist in some in some spaces. So I guess, um, and this is uh, the I guess the purpose of this this discussion today. Things to consider when we're thinking about peer review is you know when it happens, are we maximizing impact? And you know, the title was before or after publication, but you know there's arguments around before or after even conducting the study itself. You know, should we be doing registered reports, so submitting um, introductions and methods for peer review before we even do any data collection. Um, who does peer review? There's, um, I think, important questions here around inclusion and equity. If we think about, you know, the kind of status quo of journal editors selecting um, peer reviewers, then traditionally, there's not very many underrepresented groups in that journal editor space, and they generally will select people who are like them. And you've got this um, lots of, uh, like I say, underrepresented groups not included in this process as, as much as they should be. And I guess it's important for us to ask, what is it we're trying to achieve? Do the what of what we're trying to achieve in terms of, you know, in giving research studies credibility, um, improving their rigor, does that match with how how we are currently doing peer review? And I would I would argue maybe not so much. So finally, I think development and implementation of alternative methods to the status quo will need resource. Like I said, I think some of these questions are empirical questions that we we could answer, but we need to do that research. Um, I think the research is required to determine the most effective approach but we need to engage in alternatives so that we've got those that data. I think education generally will help, including training and critical appraisal. It's something that's not, I think, as, as common as it should be. I suspect, like with most things, it's reward and incentives are really are what are gonna drive changes. I'm gonna end on saying, I think any experimental design can be subverted, but what's important is knowing how to recognize when this happens. So thank you very much for listening and to, to my team. Now and there. Great, thank you very much, Emily. Um, that, was, that was great. Uh, we were having a, an issue with your slides. There was a, a, a strange uh, gray box floating in the title of, of many of them. So uh, apologies, there's various messages. I think we-, we uh, um, Oh, but we, sorry. No, I just no. realized that my sound was muted as well. So yeah, no, that was it. It's not the end of the world, but we might, if, if, if you're happy with this idea, we might get a, a, a PDF copy of them or something to, to just... Oh, of course, yeah, I'm happy for them to be shared um, as, as they are. It, it, most, of, most of the content was there. It was just the, the titles that were being um, obscured. Uh, apologies. Uh, apologies. In, the, in, the, in the audience has uh, identified the cause of the problem. I, I, I think it was probably just with your... Hopefully it was just with yours. If it happens with any of the other speakers, we'll try and shout at you early on so we can catch it uh, uh, before we get going. Now, um, as well. <laughs> don't worry, no, 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 it was, it was great. It was, a, it was very, very, very interesting. Now I know we've got a couple of questions. I'm, I'm conscious of time. So I'm going to um, just take a couple of very quick questions that have come in on the Q&A uh, that are directly relevant and then try and make sure we get on to uh, all four um, uh, talks, uh, you know, before 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 the hour is out. Um, but Samuel Fletcher, Emily, has just asked, uh, to what extent do you take your empirical results to be discipline specific uh, or generalizable to uh, many or all disciplines? And there was a bit more of this in, in the chat as well on the, the difference between, uh, you know, medical, biomedical uh, sciences and, and, say, social science. Yeah. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, it's a really good question, and and to be honest, I don't know. I think um, we 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 need to do the research. Um, the research that we've done so far has only been in the biomedical space. It has been, you know, with PLOS and and Nature, these kind of generalist biomedical journals rather than um, field specific. But how that is generalizable to other areas, um, I personally don't have have those expertise. And I think collaborating with um, others who do work in those domains will will help us. Because I think you know there's lessons to be learned from other domains. You know, I think physics and maths often get brought up as as doing things differently. Um, so I think there's lessons to be learned. And I think that interaction and not one of the problems we have is this kind of silo working um, to ensure that what we do is more generalizable. I think will be helpful. Great, thank you. 
Uh, well, I imagine our next speaker, Liam Kofi Bright, may also pick up on some angles from other bits of the disciplinary landscape as well. So uh, let's hand over to Liam uh, to uh, uh, give us the next uh, take on this on this debate. Liam. Oh, thank you very much. Just to say that my presentation just leads immediately into Remco's presentation. So save questions until after Remco's. Um, and that means he has to answer them. That's great. Um, and also, if you you know try and tell me you don't like the slides or something wrong, it's not that I can't hear you. I'm just ignoring you. I don't value your input. Okay, let's get going. Hopefully everyone can see the slides. So I'm going to be presenting research, which is um, joint between Remco and myself, and also for some bits, which I'll indicate, it was also joint with Marcus Arvin, who can't be with us today, but he's a philosophy professor somewhere in America, I think. Um, so, uh, okay, so we, so this is based on, largely based on Remco and I's paper, is peer review a good idea? And it's taking up some very similar themes from what... Uh, Emily was just talking about. So we're considering, you know, pre-publication peer review in particular. So this is this uh, charming process where before you can get a paper sort of entered into the public record of science or validated in that way, Emily said that we sort of take it that uh, something being in the literature, if it's peer reviewed, gets that sort of status increase. Um, you know, uh, the way we do that right now is, as is, you know, you submit to a journal, the journal has referees look at it, and if it passes and the editor agrees, then it gets to go in. Whereas largely what we think, you know, spoiler, we think that's not the best system and we're better off switching to a different kind of system. So that's what we're gonna be discussing today. Um, oh no, it's not moving. Well, it's a good cartoon, but well, that's it. We're gonna look at this cartoon forever. Um, oh, okay, good. Okay, so what we're going to do is, um, compare um, the status quo with a sort of uh, another way of doing things, which as Emily mentioned, um, is more typical. It's not exactly the same, but it's, it's more akin to what's currently happening in mathematics and physics. And um, in this system, you would sort of, pardon me, um, you replace journal peer review with open crowdsourced peer review. So what happens is you can post your manuscript on you know a preprint server preprint might be a bit inappropriate if that's just the way you get published but on a preprint server like archive is a famous example of this um and sort of like having done that that counts as you having entered your your piece into the sort of the scientific commons into the public domain and um that's currently how things are largely done in mathematics and physics and as as was mentioned at the start that there was a huge increase of this during the pandemic in epidemiology and some related fields in virology um and we are sort of only adding the proposal that uh we would also allow for that to be sort of like in in a similar way to you get in open peer review journals now people like can leave reviews members of the community can leave reviews of the paper they can assess it and give commentary on it and it would be available with the paper so if you go onto the archive and you download the paper you'd also be able to see reviews and commentary from peers and fellow scientists and so that sort of like we want to sort of compare what um, the effects of adopting this proposal would be with um, the status quo of the pre-publication peer review system. And then we want to do that because we thought the literature makes it possible to do a comparison between that kind of system and the kind of system we have based on empirical evidence that's already out there and an understanding of what the consequences of the different kind of center systems are. That means we're not going to say that that proposal will sort of upload to archive and then allow for open review. Um, we're not saying that's the best of all possible systems. Maybe there are other ways of organizing information sharing and whatnot in science, which would be better. But we are going to say that um, when you compare that system to the current system, according to the current ev currently available evidence in the sociology of science, in meta science, in various studies that have been done, it does look like that on all of the factors we were able to identify, hopefully that's you know all the relevant factors, but at least all the factors we were able to identify, um, our proposed alternative, the evidence suggests it would be no different or better 
And although there are some cases which we will admit and we'll discuss at the end, where it wasn't quite clear, just the evidence didn't really decide the matter one way or the other, so further study. And when we say better, we're going to be looking really um, largely or entirely at what we call epistemic consequentialism, but that's fancy philosophy words, we just mean by that. Um, we're thinking about its effects for the sort of production and sharing of knowledge, reliable information, something like that. We don't think that um, our argument depends on any niceties about exactly how you cash those things out, but just sort of broadly is science or scientific fields doing its job of informing us about the world and things we'd like to know about the world and getting that information shared out there. Um, okay, so what's going to happen now is having introduced it in a smooth and yet humorous fashion to put everyone at ease, I'm going to go for a bit of the positive um, factors. And then at just the moment it gets difficult, by sheer coincidence, my colleague Ramco will take over and uh, handle the rest. Okay, so this gives an example of the kind of positive factors we've, we're gonna look at. Um, what's like, a, so, you know, this gives you a sense of like how we reason about this. It's like, okay, what is it you want the peer review system to do? Like the journal publication system to do? Well, one thing you want to do is ensure that people have reason to quickly um, share information discoveries once they make them, right? I mean, it sounds obvious, but it's, you know, it's the obvious purpose of journals, right? It's to ensure that information is shared, got out there, disseminated. Um, and journals, you might think, play a role in that because we reward scientists. I mean, it, as Emily mentioned this, right? It's the, it's the currency of science is to have things published um, in journals as it stands. And so you might think, well, you know, the incentive to share your information is tied to the journal system. Would it mess things up to get rid of pre-publication peer review? But um, actually quite the opposite as far, as far as we can tell, right? So um, the incentive to, it's true that kind of we, the currency of science is being associated with a good manuscript. And as it stands, that's a good manuscript in the peer review having been peer reviewed. But in maths and physics, where they switch this archive system, it's just to be associated with a good, with a good manuscript that's been uploaded to the appropriate um, archive and shared that way. The incentive to share comes from being seen to be associated with the good work, not intrinsically from it going through the journal system. That just happens to be the social norm now, and that's the one we presently change. What the journal system does do is introduce these delays as there's a bureaucracy, there's a, as was mentioned, a kind of over a creaking at the joints, overworked bureaucracy associated with reviewing, getting editors to assign people, and so on and so forth. And that's just time in which the work has been done, but it's not being shared. It's not being able to be used by the scientific community. So it's not affecting our incentive to share. That exists whether or not you have the peer review system, the pre-publication peer review system that is. What it's affecting is how quickly people are in a position to take up and make use of that information. And the diagram shows various um, journals and how long you can see, you know, it can be quite a substantive delay between a manuscript being prepared and actually getting to get out there. Um, and finally, in, in some fields, there's even incentive to hold back and so to speak, withdraw that manuscript from any public circulation while it's under review, because it can break anonymity and make it more difficult to get it out there. So, you know, if anything, it sometimes incentivizes holding the work back for this time which obviously wouldn't be an issue if you could just upload to pre to a preprint server. So, you know, on what might be sort of like the most basic, obvious thing you want journals to be doing, ensuring work is shared and disseminated. Um, this is an example. Um, we are the proposal we have, where you can just have the archive. There's no evidence that it would hurt. And there's some evidence that it would help in this regard. And that's, we think, pretty typical. Um, so another example um, is, um, and this is maybe sort of the, the main thing we want to stress really when we're stressing the positives is journal, the, the journal systems that now exist just takes up a lot of time and resources and, you know, the, the labor of people with PhDs, which is socially quite valuable labor, if we do say so ourselves. Um, and, um, you know, that maybe that time could be used otherwise. Right now there are people who serve as editors. They're usually also working scientists. So they have to take their time out to, 
do the job of wrangling peer reviewers and then there's this kind of game of like find the last sucker right the person who's willing to say yes i don't say that of any hate i'm often the last sucker so you know but find a person who's willing to be like the peer reviewer which they're, they're giving their time but they're not giving their time to a paper which they've selected as the best use of their research time they're giving their time to something which a professional courtesy now exists and which a uh, norm exists whereby you have to do this sometimes and so sometimes you give your time over to reviewing um we just kind of think that um researchers are the best judges of how to allocate their time right so um what people read and what they want to focus on what they want to give detailed plot feedback to and what they don't we think it'd be better if like rather than existing this kind of soft pressure of a professional norm that you know you do some reviewing service which which we now are, sub are subject to rather people just make decisions based on what they think will be best for their for their research for their lab group for their for their intellectual um advancement um you know people sometimes say to us but won't that lead to like less there being less reading or less reviewing or less giving feedback and we think that's an example of a question where well we don't know right i mean there's there are still incentives to read people's work and try and learn from their ideas and use it to improve your own work that exists whether or not pre-publication peer review exists so it's not like it's going to go away um, and we also think people, scientists, you know, tend to take some intrinsic pleasure in exchanging, discussing ideas and exchanging their opinions. Um, so whether there'd be more or less of it, who knows, that's an empirical question. Um, but in any case, even if there was less of it, that might reflect the fact that on average, if scientists weren't subject to this norm, they would rather allocate their work time doing something else. And that's fine. We, we endorse that. We think they're the best judges. So um, that's another point where we think no evidence that it would be harmful, some evidence that at least it would be, we think it'd be good on this basis of the assumption that people are better at deciding how to allocate their own time than editors are. Um, related, oh, this is not what I thought, but okay, but like another problem with um, publications uh, right now is that there's a very well known effect of a, a gap where men on average publish more than women, even when you factor in things like how, what they're doing outside of work and what tasks are being allocated in work and what their career stage and things like that. And there's explanations of this and there's evidence for both of these and it can kind of mix, but to some degree there's gender bias in peer review that differs by different fields, but there's evidence of that. And there's also pretty strong evidence across many fields that um, women are subject to greater expectations of bias, that women expect to be held to higher standards than men do in the peer review system. So they have to spend more time um, doing things like ensuring the manuscript um, meets certain like standards of writing um, caliber, like sort of the sort of improving the aesthetics or the rhetoric of it, which isn't necessarily related to the scientific quality, but they do this out of expectation of harsher treatment from reviewers. Um, and so there's a very good work by Aaron Hengel, an economist at Liverpool, if you want to look into that. Um, now, you know, whether you, if you switch to a system without pre publication peer review, whether that will result in, um, you know, women no longer expect this and so um, get more work out there, or men no longer enjoy this unfair advantage and it gets sort of equalized that way. Either way, we take it like this is just a sort of arbitrary bias skew on what research is out there, insofar as gender, at least in some fields, might be correlated with what kind of perspectives you're bringing to bear. This might be especially relevant in the social sciences. It's a skew in what kind of knowledge is available. And so just getting rid of zeroing that factor out by the fact that you're just able to upload your work um, and not have to jump through the hurdle of impressing possibly biased reviewers gets rid of that skew. And we take that to be a good thing or at least reduces that skew. Um, another huge resource it takes up is literally just money. Um, the scientific publication, it um, like we, it's just much more expensive the way journals do it than um, the way open access or archive places do it. Um, if you look at the Elsevier and the Springer, they're, they're some of the most profitable companies in the world just because they don't do that much, but they take a bunch of labor from PhDs for free. Um, you know, I, I don't know what their relationship is with meta science. I think they're a big scam, but I don't know if I can say that, but they're a big scam. Um, and so, you know, it's really not clear to us that the value added by these journals is worth more than what we could do with these savings elsewise. In fact, we strongly suggest not. But 
at the least, whatever your judgment on that is just, as a matter of fact, money-wise, much cheaper to switch to something like an archive system and just get rid of the publication system if it's of uh, profit margins, which, I don't know, capitalists use to buy cocaine, whatever it is they do, right? So, like, I, you know, get rid of that and replace it with the archive system. Um, and then... Also, and this is where it's going to start to move into the sort of things which Trump was discussing. There's this other factor, um, which is right now, as you've mentioned a few times, the peer review system is how we decide, you know, which scientists get promoted, what kind of jobs they get, who's going to be eligible to winning grants and things like that. So how well you've done in the past, according to the peer review system and getting work out there, affects what you can be able to do in the future and sort of generates processes of cumulative advantage where the people who did well in the past get better, get, do better in the future too. Now, that's because we're using this system as like as a means of like allocating credit. And you might think if you sort of break this down of like, well, there's the sort of credit you accrue because people read your manuscript and thought it was good or the work was very valuable or you helped contribute to solving a problem or synthesizing a thing or whatever, which lots of people made use of. I think of that as like long run credit, that's sort of the considered opinion of your field or the scientific community regarding the value of your work. But then there's also a kind of short run boost to your image, like the mere fact that a publication is in nature or science, that is in itself impressive, like it just looks good on a CV, it's like literally a CV line, people refer it that way. That was even that somewhat cynical cartoon which Emily showed, um, like that was kind of the joke there, right? Um, and so basically, you know, we think that when you think about this, if you want to be using this kind of credit way of allocating scientific careers at all, it's the long run credit is the one you actually care about, right? Like the short run credit is only valuable if it's going to be a good proxy for the long run credit, because what you really want to know is, are they doing actually useful work? Not just, is it is it in a journal which I associate with good work? Um, and um, so for one thing, just switching to the archive system is already in, automatically, so to speak, placing more emphasis on long run credit. And as, as we'll see, I think it's also something to be said about it. Um, there's more to be said here, but that's gonna be got in Remco's bit. Like it's not just there's it putting more emphasis on long run credit, but we might also be suspicious of the role of short run credit. Liam, sorry to cut across, but we're running tight on time. So I'm gonna- This have is to... my literal last slide. Okay, great, thanks. So I've got, got you there, I've got you. Um, so, okay, so the last thing to say is, and as was mentioned by Emily as well, um, journal editors, like the current way the system works, gives this kind of outsized influence to, to journal editors who are kind of able to um, decide who, who reviews, what gets published and what doesn't. And that means that like a small number of people, the journal editors are deciding what work gets out there, or at least who, who has a chance of get, getting their work out there. And it's more democratic to just like have the whole scientific community judge. That might sound like I'm just making a moral or political argument, but it's not just that it's, you know, democracy is nice, but actually we think that will lead to a better way of a more accurate evaluation of scientific work. And on that note, I switch over to Renko. Great, thanks, Liam. And, and just to say, sorry, we are running a bit late on time. So Remco, if you can keep your half as concise and punchy as possible, that would just give us time to hear both from Daniela and to have some discussion. Sorry about that. This is a 60 minute session. I think I've been told we can go over by up to 10 minutes, but no more than that. Uh, so sorry that the yeah, time. All right. I'll, uh, I'll make an effort to that, uh, to that effect. So can you see my slides? Good. And they're no, there's no longer a weird bar that's blocking the thing like was it Emily? Great, yeah. Okay, so uh, thanks Liam. Um, I'm just gonna do the last positive factor and then briefly run through the neutral and the uncertain factors, right? So this key point here about epistemic sorting is sort of in a way a defensive move, right? So it's like the thought is from a defender of the current system, like trying to put forward a strong case for why we have journal peer review. And it's this idea that um, we're trying to sort papers into journals based on a sort of hierarchy of journals that reflects a kind of notion of quality. And so the best papers go into best journals, the mediocre papers go into mediocre journals and so on. And so both outsiders and insiders can use the journals as an indicator, um, as it has a kind of signaling function so that you can find easily the highest quality work. Now, 
there are some caveats about how valuable it is to have such a thing and whether we even can have such a thing. But I've just been told that we have 60 minutes instead of 90 minutes for this se session. So we shall just uh, skip over that. The key point that I want to make is that we think there's reason to believe that the sort of post-publication model that Liam describes can actually do these epistemic sorting role better, or at least just as well as the current system can. And so the argument is based on the condorcet jury theorem, which is a famous mathematical result that the key feature of which is that if you need to get an accurate opinion on something, it's better to ask more people than fewer right? Because everyone has maybe some little bit of relevant insight. And if you just sort of take a vote, then you have a better chance of getting it right if you have more people in that voting population. That's roughly the Condorcet jury theorem. Now, why is that relevant here, right? That's because we think that with a post-publication peer review model, you're going to have on average more reviewers per paper than with a pre-publication journal solicited peer review model. Why would that be? Basically two reasons, right? First, you're sort of opening up your pool of reviewers by letting everyone that wants to review, not just the people that get actively invited by an editor. And the second reason, maybe the most important one, is that you can get, because you're opening up the peer review system, you can get more reviewers per paper with the same amount of work, right? On the current system, you know, a paper might be received two reviews, get rejected from a journal, then receive two reviews at the next journal and get accepted there. So now, each journal is basing its decision on two review reports, but in an open peer review system with the same amount of work, you would have had four reviews for that work, right? So we expect for those two reasons, the average number of reviewers per paper would increase if you move to an open post-publication peer review model. And because of something like the Condorcet jury theorem, that's a reason to expect that it would actually make better quality judgments, right? Now the standards Condorcet jury theorem has this key assumption, it's kind of a binary setting. You might wanna relax that assumption, then you get a different version of the theorem. Again, I'm skipping over some details in the interest of time. And the other important assumption that I wanna highlight here is probabilistic independence of the reviewer judgments, right? So you have to have the reviewers, um, at least in a probabilistic sense, uh, make the judgments independently. You might worry about that, right? Especially in an open peer review model, will they actually be probabilistically independent if they can see each other's review? It's a complicated issue. Um, we have a bunch of things to say about it, but the most important one I think here is at the bottom, which is that if you're a genuine expert, you're being asked to review a paper, right? Then you should have some kind of independent line of reasoning for why you think a particular bit of work is good or bad. Right? That's kind of just what it means to be an expert, right? You're not just parroting other experts' opinions. You have your own reasoning, as good or bad as it may be in a particular case, for thinking whatever it is you think. Okay, great. So based on the Condorcet jury theorem, we conclude that, um, and, and some related arguments, we conclude that open peer review might do a better job at epistemic sorting than um, close pre-publication peer review. So that's the last of the positive factors. There are a couple of neutral factors here, which I'll go over very quickly, again, in the interest of time. Fraud detection, we just think peer review is not really the time and place. Peer review, as they say, is neither a replication or a lie detecting device, right? So you just need to have something else if you want to detect fraud. And so for our purposes here, it's just a wash. Similarly, when it comes to herding or faddishness, right? You might think that getting rid of journals would uh, discourage people from going after fads or popular topics, if you even think those are a problem, which we don't take a stand on here. But we don't actually buy into that um, because we think that there's always reason to follow fads in a credit economy, right? Where people need to draw attention to their work. All right. So these uncertain factors, they're quite important, right? So these are some of the key objections that people have raised where we think we don't really have a full response because there's just not enough evidence on this issue currently, right? And the first of the two is this one on um, the role of prestige bias, right? So the thought goes, present system, less small fish sees the headlines, right? A graduate student can publish in Nature. If you take away the journals, right? If you take away Nature, then how is a graduate student ever gonna get attention for their work? 
everyone's just going to go read the papers by the most famous people. So we have a two part response, right? The first part is just what I already said. We just don't really know. We do know that places like nature also suffer from prestige bias. Um, so it's just a question of how this shakes out on balance. And it's actually not clear what the, what the precise answer there is. So more research is needed. And the second point is that um, if you're so concerned about you know, graduate students or marginalized researchers, researchers in the global south or at smaller institutions, whatever it may be. Um, there's all kinds of researchers, the vast majority, in fact, that are not getting a ton of attention for their work. And if you're so concerned about them, then just sticking to the present publishing system is not really a very satisfying response, right? If you're genuinely concerned about these um, marginalized researchers, then we should actively be looking at reforms that help that group, mostly orthogonal probably to the way we organize peer review, for example, uh, something like more randomized funding distribution. All right. So the other uncertain factor that I want to highlight is once you turn, um, once you open up peer review, right, you've got kind of a social media like model of science publication now. And so you should be worried about some of the problems that have plagued social media, for example, um, mobs that come and distort reviewer scores by um, because they have some sort of political axe to grind or for some other reason that is orthogonal to the sort of epistemic goals of science. So that's, I think, a real problem, something we need to be concerned about, especially if we let anyone that wants to um, make a review on this, on this um, archive system. Right, you could of course restrict access, but then I think you lose also a lot of the benefit of what we're proposing here, which is again to bring in different views uh, into scientific issues. One of the benefits that we're hoping for is that um, maybe if a particular field is a bit of stuck in the ruts, then some outsider can come in with new ideas. And that's exactly the sort of thing that you risk losing if you start restricting access to this open peer review system. So we don't like that as an answer, but it does suggests the direction to go, namely just distinguishing between known experts, recognized experts, and what I like to call putative experts, which is everyone else, right? Um, just having two separate scores that keep track of these two different groups can give you a sense for what, where the opinions are coming from that you're seeing. And if they come apart, right, the recognized experts and everyone else's opinion, then that doesn't tell you whether this is the outsiders calling out groupthink or whether it's the outsiders manip trying to manipulate the score, but at least you'll know that you have to pay extra attention in that particular case. Great, so that's basically uh, in a highly abbreviated form how we respond to these two uncertain factors. I'll just leave it here so that Daniela has a chance to say a few things as well. Um, so here's just a summary of the factors we discussed. And I'll hand it back over to uh, James and Daniela. Great. Thank you, Remco, very much. I'm sorry uh, to have to tighten the time a bit. We'll move straight to Daniela. There have been lots of questions picking up really on that last uh, issue of uncertainty about the, the potential for trolls and, and uh, you know, pylons in, in, the, in the opened review space. But we'll pick up that as a discussion point for the whole panel, I think after we've heard from Daniela. So over to you, Daniela. Sorry again, the time is-, is Hopefully that leaves me something to discuss. <laughs> <laughs> so um, thank you, everybody. Um, I uh, have shared my slides. Uh, I will share my screen, but I won't actually go over everything because I do want to leave space to such a debate. Um, although it's interesting because I think we all kind of have very similar views. Um, so hopefully we can disagree on something or otherwise it's just- <laughs> No, I, I'm just kidding, but um, okay. So the, we know all the question, uh, and as a, uh, I, I heard, heard debates is like we are supposed to answer the question we wish we were asked. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and do that. Uh, the presentation is available at the Bitly preview, uh, as I put it on. I put it on the chat, so you don't need to need to read that. Uh, so. Um, we heard a lot about what we think all is wrong with the peer review system. And I think that that is um, uh, what, you know, they asked the, the question that we try to, uh, to think about a lot and pre-review. 
um, the peer reviewer uh, pool is small, is very homogeneous, uh, uh, not just as a gender, as uh, Liam was, was um, also touching on, that has been demonstrated. It's kind of easier to demonstrate with data that we have available, but it's uh, also very homogeneous in terms of geographical location. Uh, we can expect it to be very homogeneous uh, from um, uh, a racial and ethical, ethnical point of view and uh, disabilities and other dimensions of diversity that are not represented. Um, in fact, uh, there is actually, uh, and I didn't have uh, links to publications here, but I, I can, uh, that re most reviewers and, and editors uh, also are um, tend to be male uh, in their mid or late career, their research um, uh, careers of point of their uh, mid to late points of their careers and are uh, often opaquely selected by journal editors as experts in the field. Um, and uh, yet there is not uh, any formal training. Uh, there is more effort has been, has been put into put some trainings into how to review, but uh, expertise um, reverts a lot around uh, uh, elements of uh, prestige and years of, of engagement with research. We can correlate with expertise, but uh, it doesn't mean that if someone has been in research for many years, they can actually be good reviewers. Um, and also areas of reviews that goes unrecognized um, uh, for the most part. So um, I think one point that I want to make that I, is that I want to reinforce in all these discussions, many of these things have been discussed already, but it's just that peer review and the process of peer review and scholarly publication doesn't happen in the vacuum, but it actually happens in the context of a huge mess that we have uh, uh, built uh, through history, and uh, that includes many systems of oppressions that manifest in the peer review process. And so I think like often we talk about like, let's just very logical and pragmatically see what, how we can fix peer review, but we kind of like turn, tend to forget how um, we can try to make a lot of changes, but we also need to, to go hand in hand with like uh, systemic changes um, that can uh, lower uh, the barriers to uh, participation access um, and so forth. Uh, so a pre-review, um, we pre -review, what is pre-review? We we have a Procrint review platform. Uh, I'm just I have some slides about it, but I'm not going to go into details. Um, and but we really wanted to make it our mission to um, uh, engage. Uh, um, to bring more equity and transparency into peer review by, by engaging and empowering researchers, particular researchers that have been traditionally excluded from the process. And uh, the review of preprint is, is the means uh, to do that. And um, if I have to answer, try to answer the question right now, I guess I am on the position of um, post-publication peer review, but just because I think the preprints are publication. Um, and, um, and I'm just gonna make more of that point at the end. Um, so, this is just to, to say, like, we um, really want to make our researchers, um, uh, empower our researchers to engage in peer review. And so the platform is kind of the home for the communities we want to see flourish. And then we organize trainings. We really believe that uh, training empowerment and mentorships um, are all go hand in hand. Um, and uh, community reviews, we are uh, chats like this on Zoom around uh, preprints uh, to bring more perspectives to um, uh, to the publication at the point in time in which change can still happen. Um, so this is just a screenshot of the platform where basically anyone with an ORCID ID can make an account and review preprints uh, across preprint servers uh, and do that uh, rapidly by answering a series of yes or no questions. This is just a screenshot um, that shows um, a review that was a, a preprint on BioArchive and next to it uh, five uh, rapid uh, reviews. Um, which are just answers to uh, some yes or no uh, questions uh, to capture the essence of the review, or they can do um, also uh, in a full length. Um, one aspect about, um, we, we talked about trolling, so uh, someone raised that issue, and uh, because we want to really think about how to bring everybody in, uh, we also have to recognize that vulnerable uh, uh, groups and identities, and I want, and I, we was very considering one of them as an early career researcher, afraid of putting my comments out there. Um, we have a way of um, a built-in anonymity um, uh, uh, posting. However, uh, there is also built-in accountability because as you join pre-review, you get assigned two personas. One that is your public persona that kind of imports all public data from ORCID and it connects to your ORCID ID. But you can also choose to use a, a pseudoname that is assigned to you as you join as the form of a, any a random color and a random animal. So you may end up being, I don't know, 
yellow octopus. Um, and with that pseudonym, you can decide to uh, um, request feedback, provide feedback on pre-review. However, if there is a violation of the code of conduct that the community itself can actually report, um, and then there is a process to moderate it uh, post-publication, so no pre-publication, then you can be uh, 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 safely, not safely, but you can be blocked or removed from the platform because the backend will always connect to your ORCID ID. Um, we can talk more about other uh, ways that we can uh, prevent trolls, but uh, I think that the for us, and I'm not going to go, these are just details about the platform. Um, oops, apologies. Um, for us, the important thing is that we want to build a space in which uh, community and research communities can understand what, or, or uh, kind of uh, buy in some of these core values, but also find their own sense of belonging and their ocean purpose and, and uh, shape culture together. And so in a pre-review, we are we just launched communities. And what that is, is that on pre-review, different groups can uh, start um, uh, uh, a community on, on the platform. And we have some initial features in this MVP that can be changed. But the goal is to uh, give more freedom to these communities to kind of uh, grow in their own space on, on uh, providing reviews when that could be like changing the way that the rapid, pre the rapid pre review sort of question is, uh, load different templates, organize their own events, but kind of uh, being part of this um, kind of network of preprint reviewers that share uh, the, the values of being transparent and being constructive uh, and wanting to work together towards a better uh, way of providing evaluations. These are just some communities that are either already there or growing on pre-review. Uh, and I wanna, I'm gonna leave on this, as, like, this is, um, I have two more elements that I think are very important to this discussion. And um, uh, we talk a lot about like, uh, rightfully, equity, diversity, and inclusion so it's key things. We really think that equity is one of the, the most important lens through which we should be thinking about how the future of peer review, the future of scholarship goes through, regardless of it's before or after publication. But it's like thinking about how can we uh, to work together to bring tools uh, and, and uh, resources can actually uh, lower the barriers of the, or remove those barriers altogether that have been put um, uh, for re, uh, research communities that don't have, um, that have not historically been uh, uh, brought to the same level uh, as others. Um, I am just going to skip over this and I just want to end with like, uh, I think trust is the element um, also that we ultimately want to to bring trust to these new ways of doing uh, uh, of doing uh, peer review and evaluation and scholarly publication. However, uh, a lot of the uh, um, the discussions around trust in the open science movement is always like, how can the establishment trust that these new ways will work? That these new experts will actually or reviewers will actually be experts? And um, is it going to be a rigorous process? And I we want to kind of flip that thinking, and it's like, how can we actually work together to build a system that that communities that have been traditionally excluded can trust to come and not be exploited and not have their knowledge appropriated um, and, and really count on having uh, their voices centered and uh, put forward. So I um, think that we need to work together and think about how we can, uh, who we deal reform with. And here are just some examples of things that we're doing with different communities. Um, and so the answer to the question is that I think it doesn't really matter when we do peer review. Um, we obviously stand for the let's do it as early as possible, even before preprints, uh, to be honest, but we can have that discussion. Uh, but the, the key thing is that just if let's build it and people will come, will definitely lead to having homogeneous communities to come to that because we've seen that over and over. So that will not work. So I just want to leave with that. Sorry, it took probably more time than I should have, uh, but let's get on with the discussion. Thanks very much. Excellent. Thank you, Daniela. That was a great uh, overview. And, and thanks also for all those resources uh, and your slides that you've posted mm -hmm. online, uh, which are fantastic. So yes, we've got 10 minutes, folks, uh, for discussion. We've stretched the session. Uh, I think there was some confusion over there was this, this was a 90 or 60 minute. It is now a 70 minute session. So hopefully uh, uh, all our speakers and our uh, wider audience can stick with us for another 10 minutes. I'm going to dive into the Q&A box, which I'm sure some of the speakers also have been looking at over the course of the talks. And a lot of the 
questions here are centering really on, on points that you've just touched on, Daniela, and which, which also came up in uh, uh, Liam and Remco's uh, uh, presentation around really whether the creation of these structures uh, enabling, uh, you know, more open online commentary can be protected and safeguarded against some of the um, bad behaviours and more troubling features that we see in uh, other areas of online uh, debate. I uh, used to, for five or six years, edit a blog on the Guardian newspaper, a science policy blog, and was very, very familiar with the challenges of, you know, moderating open comment on a big global <laughs> news site like the Guardian. Um, you've already suggested, Daniela and Remco as well, some ways around this, but uh, if I just dive into the questions and pull out some of the points that are being made, um, Heather Douglas, uh, hi Heather, uh, has posed the question as how do we keep post-publication review from becoming Reddit cesspools? Maybe this is about having open IDs, but who moderates it? And she's raised a very important question about the risk of behaviour being worse, as it were, or, 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 or inappropriate behaviour being more directly targeted against uh, women or, or, or other uh, minority groups who... Um, uh, and also, I guess, researchers who are working on topics that are politically controversial and may attack, may, may attract the ire of either left or right for whichever reason. So how do we kind of protect these spaces and stop them uh, uh, being overtaken? Rose Franson making a similar uh, kind of comment, but also how do we stop other bad behaviours that we see in conventional peer review, you know, reviewer circles, uh, paper mills, people just pumping each other up because it, it'll, it'll help the, the, the process or help their, you know, them, them get on in other ways. Um, Alavo uh, Amaral offering a positive counter example. Can we solve some of those difficulties through hierarch hierarchical moderator models like Wikipedia, which, you know, obviously does have ways of weeding out inappropriate contributions, uh, et cetera. You don't want to hear from me, over to you. Who would like to kick off? Emily, should we go back to you? Uh, we haven't heard from before, but try and keep comments relatively punchy because we're down to seven minutes now. Emily. Well, I feel like I've already answered the question. I should maybe open it up to the others who have, have addressed this kind of more directly. I guess I'd maybe add another question in, instead. Is is there evidence so f you know to date about trolling in post public code? You know, is it happening or is it is it a fear that we are imagining more than is is reality? But I, I think Daniela and, and Remco, because I think they've talked about this moderation, it'd be good to, to pass the buck, as it were. Yeah, that is a very good question, actually. I mean, in terms of existing sites and, and you know platforms like F1000, is this a problem now? I, 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 if it is, I'm not aware of it, but, but Remco... I, I, I can just say real quick that we have not seen it. We have not. So we have ways for any community member to report report um, violation of code of conduct. I read the reviews still now when they're published because I get notifications and I have never seen that. I also want to say, like, it's not... To us, it's not just about, like, preventing that person to come and say, like, oh, you are, like, uh, you should just get out, like, you know, real clear violations, right? But it's also, like, how we provide uh, criticism in... Because in the context of academia, I feel like we are raised to like, oh, it's gonna be like you have to be, you know, we have to oppose the the, the the other person's opinion. It's just about how we provide feedback that often is not constructive and helpful, and it makes the other person feel like defensive. So I think that in that uh, aside for like having a code of conduct that is very clear and enforcing and centering that in the messaging of the platform or the environment, whatever the event that you have, is also making sure that we build in training for for how to provide constructive feedback. And so I'm just gonna put a link. We just released some, some uh, guides and guidelines around that where we have clear example, of like here you say the same exact thing, but this is a way that the author will do something with. And this is a way that you're just gonna make them feel bad and nothing will happen. So I think there is a spectrum of bad behaviors that we should just get uh, rid of. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just, a couple of, uh, just a couple of further points on this. Um, so, one, um, I really like Daniela's suggestion, and it's, I'm happy to hear that it's largely the fears aren't worth coming true there. And I think the thing that makes that work is there's this kind of reputational score element to it, and also I mean, that also provides a means of enforcing the code of conduct. A lot of the worst 
things in academia, both uh, actually happens with anonymous peer reviews and also the, when there's like an like econ job rumors or whatever else, there's like this very sort of abusive spaces online in academia. It's because you get a lot of anonymous commentary and um, that's not a feature of these, I think. So like, I do think that some of these fears are based on anonymous context, which peer review incorporates, pre-publication peer review incorporates, um, which, which aren't as much of a feature here. But I wanted to pick up on the other thing, which is that Heather asked, how could we, you know, who, how could we ensure people are properly rewarded for this labor? Well, as, as um, mentioned in our slides, um, there are just huge monetary savings made by um, switching from the current system to anything like an archive system. We could take some of that money and make this like properly compensated work. Like you just actually, not just people volunteering their time, depending on how conscientious they are, but rewarded for it properly using our communal resources in a way we find more valuable that would be my suggestion that's the kind of thing which we could do because we'd be freeing up so much resources by switching to this system thanks and i think that also goes somewhere to answering bianca's question which was about the reward system um remka anything specific otherwise i'll try and take another question before we wrap up uh, let me just say one thing real quick I, i'm really excited at, uh, to hear from daniela that she's experimenting with sort of the mixture of parts being anonymous and non-anonymous um, I didn't quite catch from your presentation if this also applies to authors, um, but like, because someone in the Q&A mentioned, part of the, one of the questions that you just mentioned, James, was that issue about like the role that double anonymous review can play in protecting from bias. And there's no reason in principle why you couldn't do that under an open model as well. I don't, I'm not necessarily advocating that, but this is something you could experiment with at least. <clears throat> We don't host the preprints. The preprints are posted somewhere else, and they have names. So it's just it's just for the reviewers. Yeah. No. Thank you for that. That's very helpful. Um, we're just going to squeeze one last question in, and, and allow all of you to do sort of thirty seconds on this before we wrap up and close. David uh, uh, Reinstein has has basically supported the proposal to to move, uh, you know, towards post uh, publication review models, but has. Uh, raise an important question which is how do we coordinate initiatives in this space and make sure uh, that we don't end up dividing and weakening our impact uh, simply because there's too many different competing platforms and tools to uh, both do this but also to create rewards and incentives for doing it and I think most of us recognize even as we try and participate and support alternative models of doing this it can be quite uh, confusing and time consuming to sort of be you know filling in and getting the credit on this platform or that platform for doing this or that so just just final thoughts on on that um again i'm going to start daniela with you because you're probably at the sharp end of, of this as offering one of you know one such platform but uh, quick thoughts from you and then from others and we'll wrap up so the can you repeat that question super real quick because i was like just looking at yeah, no, how, some how, other. Do we, how do we avoid even if we want to support moves in this direction how do we avoid the the move itself being weakened by the sheer proliferation of different platforms and tools for sure. doing it either yeah, doing, I think, doing the reviewing or getting credit for doing it right so i think that just the inter interoperability is going to be uh, the answer we've tried to uh, bring in some um, other elements like plot it incorporate plot it into pre-review and now we're working towards um uh in inter basically uh, or interoperability of pre-review with other servers and uh, i you know, I uh, I think that in the end, it is a very helpful to have these different experiments that happen. Like PCI is a great example of how there is preprint reviews that happens in a, it's a similar way in a sense that you have an editorial group that chooses the reviewers. Uh, and so, or uh, we had, I think, right, I, I came in at the tail of the previous talk, there was like crowd fighters that I think was like talking about also a crowd um, bringing volunteers to like uh, 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 mentors and provide feedback. But I, I think that, uh, ultimately, we do need these differences to see what will work and what will not. Uh, so I am, I am for like let's collaborate if we can, but also like let's if we don't agree on exactly the model, let's also try uh, different uh, different experiments to see where we all uh, go. But uh, te technical interoperability definitely helps if we if we can manage that. For sure, yeah. Thank you for that. Anyone else want to come in with a Remco? Are you is that a hand? Yeah, uh, Remco, quickly. Yeah, I largely agree with what Daniela said, and I would actually emphasize mm -hmm. that it's not necessarily the goal to create a new monolithic system that then dominates the whole publishing uh, industry, right? Like the whole 
I think a big, big part of the idea is to create a proliferation for the sake of having a proliferation, not for the sake of identifying the best one and then settling on it, or at least I could see it um, developing in that direction. And I think there's a difference between being aware of the different things that are happening and versus unintended replication and division of labor. Um, so, you know, I'm a big fan of letting a thousand flowers bloom. And I think that's essentially what's happening. Well, everyone else said something, so I'd feel foolish if I didn't weigh in. Um, yeah, I, yeah I, I agree with many of what my esteemed colleagues have said. Excellent. <laughs> Admirably uh, succinct. Thank you all very much for that. Uh, we got through actually most of the questions that were on here. Sorry, Samuel Fletcher, your question you'll have to send to uh, Liam and Remco uh, separately. But uh, apologies for, for the slightly tight timing. I do think that, that was a great session and, and some very practical and concrete uh, proposals being uh, advanced there for how we can, uh, uh, if you like, move beyond the debate to an actual constructive uh, next phase in, in, in the, the peer review structures and systems that surround us. So thank you all very much. Uh, I'm sure you'll want to join me again in saying thank you to our four panellists, uh, to Emily, to Liam, to Remco and Daniela. Uh, I'm James Wilson, thank you. And we'll pass over to the next section. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks everyone.